In the year 1396, one of the largest allied armies medieval Christendom had ever assembled was mobilized and ready to march upon the House of Osman. The fate of the Ottoman presence in the Balkans, and perhaps the empire as a whole, was on the line. In this episode of our series on the history of the Ottoman Empire, we will cover one of the most critical military engagements in Ottoman history, the Battle of Nicopolis, the crowning achievement of Sultan Bayezid I, the Thunderbolt. If you want any chance of getting a cool name like that, you better start by looking the part, and we've got an offer to help. This video is sponsored by Ridge, who bring you the Ridge Ring. This is a premium ring built with modern techniques. The beveled edge and convex interior makes them extra comfy. The high-end materials like carbon fiber, tungsten carbide, and titanium make it extremely strong, and lets you flex on even Bayezid the Thunderbolt, whose best men couldn't even approach these materials. Plus, each ring comes with a dual-band silicon ring for a comfy, casual alternative. But perhaps best of all is the fact that if you lose your ring, or if you change weight and need to get it resized, Ridge will do that for you for free twice. Yes, with Ridge you don't need to be a sultan to get premium goods and premium customer service, and we're going to make it even better with a discount code. Use code KINGSANDGENERALS at ridge.com slash kingsandgenerals to get 10% off. Add a little sophistication to your fingers with the robust and stylish Ridge Ring, a ring for life. Go to ridge.com slash kingsandgenerals. Two years after initially declaring the anti-Ottoman crusade, King Sigismund of Hungary was finally ready to face the forces of the Thunderbolt. During the late summer of 1396, the Crusader army paraded out of Buda and began their march south alongside the left bank of the Danube. Knowing that he could not supply his large army in one spot for any length of time, the Hungarian king opted for a more mobile solution, the preemptive invasion of Ottoman Bulgaria. This would be the first phase of his anti-Ottoman crusade, as re-establishing Christian rule in the region would serve as a buffer to his kingdom against Ottoman aggression. After taking Bulgaria, the crusaders likely planned to move further south and lift the blockade of Constantinople. Alongside the main crusader contingent heading south, a smaller eastern contingent was sent through Transylvania into Wallachia to restore Mircea I to his throne. Capturing the region would give Sigismund control over the northern bank of the Danube, which would play an essential role in his future invasion of Ottoman Bulgaria. Meanwhile, the crusader fleet supplied by Genoa, Venice and the Knights Hospitaller had begun their naval operations in the Aegean Sea, resulting in the harassment of Ottoman shipping in the region. In addition to these developments, the Bosporus and Dardanelles Straits were also blocked by the Crusader navy, thus permanently cutting off Bayezid from his Anatolian holdings. After Constantinople was resupplied with goods and additional troops, a small contingent of the Crusader navy sailed into the Black Sea and then into the Danube River to rendezvous with the main Crusader army. Back in the west, the main Crusader army under Sigismund crossed into the lands of Bayezid's vassal, the Tsardom of Vidin, through the coastal town of Oshova. After spending eight days crossing over the Danube, the army found itself at the gates of the regional capital of Vidin. Seeing that a large Crusader army was at his gates, and witnessing the death of a Bulgarian monarch at the hands of Bayezid the previous year, Tsar Ivan Stratsimir of Vidin opened the gates of his kingdom to the Crusaders. What followed would be the massacre and imprisonment of the local Ottoman garrison in the capital town. During the aftermath of the bloody event, Stratsimir resupplied the Crusader army and gave Sigismund free passage into Ottoman Bulgaria through his realm. While the main Crusader army began its operations in the local region, the smaller Crusader force marching into Wallachia had also secured some gains of its own. The forces of the pro-Ottoman Wallachian usurper Vlad I had been pushed back into the eastern portions of Wallachia, while Mircea I regained his capital of Kotir de Ajesh. This gave the Hungarian king access to large sections of the northern bank of the Danube, which would be vital in resupplying his vast mobile host, which marched on the opposite bank of the river. However, despite these early successes, not all would go as intended for the Crusader army. Tensions between the Western Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches had been ongoing since the days of the East-West Schism of 1054 
and the Fourth Crusade of 1204. Both groups often saw the members of the opposing church as untrustworthy, and in some cases heretical, on par with Muslims. These sectarian tensions between the members of the two churches would rear their ugly heads during Sigismund's crusade. In the days following Vidin's submission, crusader forces fanned out across the countryside of the Tsardom and plundered the region indiscriminately. As the main crusader army marched west alongside the Danube, they arrived at the strongly fortified town of Oyehovo. Seeing that the odds were heavily against them, the local Ottoman garrison of the town offered King Sigismund terms of surrender in return for their lives and the lives of the Muslim populace of the town. The Hungarian king accepted the offer, as he had plans for the region after the crusade. However, after the surrender of the town, the Franco-Burgundian element of the crusader army, in an act of open defiance, disregarded the terms of peace. The local Ottoman garrison was massacred, alongside the town's Muslim and Eastern Orthodox populace, much to the horror and frustration of Sigismund. Despite the internal religious tension bubbling up within his army, King Sigismund continued towards the Ottoman fortress town of Nicopolis. In the year after its capture, the former Bulgarian capital had been strengthened with new fortifications and a well-supplied garrison led by Ottoman martial lord Doan Bey. The town stood on a high position overlooking the Danube and had been a vital ferry location for the Ottomans going into Wallachia. According to Sigismund, Nicopolis had to be captured if Christian rule were ever to return to Bulgaria. As a result, during the first weeks of September, the fortress of Nicopolis was put under siege. This time around, the Ottoman defenders stood their ground, for they had most likely heard about the brutal fates of their brethren in Vidin and Oyehovo. Seeing that Nicopolis would not surrender, the Crusader army constructed siege works and mines over the next few days, while supplies and reinforcements from Wallachia and the Crusader fleet arrived from the Danube. During the Crusaders' advance, the Sultan had been personally overseeing the blockade of Constantinople. Now he focused on the advancing enemy and began mustering forces to confront his foe directly. Seeing that he had to strike the Crusader army before they could gain a significant foothold in Bulgaria, Bayezid gave out orders for his armies in the Balkans, including his vassal Stefan Lazarevich, to gather in Edena and Plovdiv. The Sultan planned on catching the Crusader army off guard by assembling his army behind the Balkans mountains, far from the prying eyes of Crusader scouting parties, then force marching said army to Nicopolis. In the first weeks of September, Bayezid would leave a small force to continue the blockade of Constantinople, while he and his 20,000-strong Ottoman host began his march north to meet the forces of Sigismund. The Ottoman response to the crusade would be a swift one. In later centuries, it took an Ottoman army up to six weeks to assemble its ranks and another three weeks to travel from Edirne to the Danube. However, completing this journey took the Thunderbolt only two weeks. Much to the surprise and panic of the crusaders, on the 22nd of September, Bayezid's host was spotted near Tarnovo by their scouting parties in the region. Only two days later, the Ottoman Sultan had established a war camp several kilometers south of Nicopolis. According to Ottoman chronicles, under the Shroud of Darkness, Bayezid rode to the walls of Nicopolis to inform the local Ottoman garrison of the arrival of his army. The Sultan promised Doan Bey and his men that come the next day, he would shatter the Crusader army beneath the walls of their fortress. In retaliation for the sudden arrival of the Ottoman army at Nicopolis, thousands of the remaining Muslim prisoners from Vidin and Oyehovo were rounded up near the Crusader camp and executed. The gruesome struggle for Nicopolis had just begun. Even though they had defeated a minor Ottoman scouting party in the days before Bayezid's arrival, many in the Crusader camp were skeptical about how to approach their current situation. The Crusader host was now stuck between the local garrison of Nicopolis and Bayezid's large host, and worse still, they had the impassable Danube River to their rear. In one swift move, the Ottoman Sultan had managed to besiege the besiegers of Nicopolis. As a result of their situation, a war council was called by Sigismund during the evening of the 24th of September. The decision to face the Ottoman host the following morning was agreed on. However, the Hungarian king advised to take a more cautious approach. He wanted the Wallachian and Transylvanian contingents of his army to head the Crusader assault, 
as they had the most experience in fighting against the Ottomans. After all, the veteran voivode Mircea of Wallachia had defeated Bayezid on two separate occasions in the years before the Crusade. Meanwhile, Sigismund also advised the Franco-Burgundian and Hungarian elements of the army to support the main attack in case of an Ottoman counterattack. This advice fell on deaf ears, as Sigismund's thoughtful strategy was ignored due to internal divisions within the Crusader camp once again resurfacing. Many Franco-Burgundian leaders were outraged with Sigismund's plan, seeing it as dishonorable to enter battle behind the Wallachians and Transylvanians, whom they regarded as peasants. The constable of France, Philippe of Artois, even accused the Hungarian monarch of trying to steal the honor and glory of the battle for himself. After many hours of shouting and fussing, Sigismund would cave in to the demands of the Franco-Burgundian leaders. Their western knights would now head the crusader assault. During the morning of September 25th, the numerically even Ottoman and Crusader armies deployed for battle south of Nicopolis. On the Crusader side, the mounted Franco-Burgundian knights made up the first line, while King Sigismund and his mainly Hungarian contingent made up the second line behind them. Wallachian troops led by Mircea were stationed on the Crusader left wing, while Transylvanian troops led by Stefan Lakfi were stationed on the Crusader right wing. A small contingent of crusaders was left behind to continue the siege on Nicopolis. Unlike their crusader counterparts, the Ottoman army was far more centralized in its command structure. Ottoman Akinji light horsemen made up the front line, while behind them was a mix of irregular light infantry from Anatolia and the Balkans, called Azabs. Behind them were Bayezid's household troops, also known as the Kabikulu which comprised several thousand elite Janissaries and Kabikulu Sapahi heavy cavalry. They were led by the Sultan himself and his Grand Vizier Jandilazadi Ali Pasha. Meanwhile, the Ottoman right wing consisted of Balkan Timali Sapahi heavy cavalry, led by the Sultan's eldest son, Suleiman Chelebi. On the Ottoman left wing were the Anatolian Timali Sapahi heavy cavalry, led by Kara Timutash Pasha. Lastly, on the extreme Ottoman left wing were the mounted Serbian knights, led by their prince, Stefan Lazarevich. In the hours leading up to the battle, King Sigismund sent scouting parties to locate Ottoman positions south of Nicopolis to find the camp spares it had concealed from the Crusaders. Due to this situation, the battle was delayed for another two hours, much to the annoyance of the Franco-Burgundian element of the army. Soon the waiting became too much for the Frenchmen to bear. Then a battle cry by Philippe of Artois was heard as he seized a banner of the Virgin Mary. Forward in the name of God and Saint George, today you shall see me a valorous knight. Before a general order to advance was given, Franco-Burgundian knights under their eager commanders unexpectedly charged forward to seek out the enemy themselves, much to the horror of many senior leaders in the Crusader camp. After some time advancing forward, off in the distance, the Franco-Burgundian line spotted Ottoman Akinji light horsemen scouting their positions. Seeing an opportunity to gain glory on the battlefield, the mounted western knights of Europe proceeded to charge into the lightly armoured ranks of the Ottoman Akinjis, resulting in heavy losses for the Muslims. With the remaining Akinji retreating back towards the Ottoman camp and believing they had won a great victory, the Franco-Burgundian mounted knights continued moving forward to make contact with the main Ottoman line. However, as the knights continued riding forward, they encountered a steep slope topped by a forest of sharpened stakes. Behind the stakes lay the main Ottoman line of Azabs, who were armed with various weapons such as axes, maces, bows and spears. Under immense arrow fire from the enemy, Many knights dismounted from their horses to get through the Ottoman defences uphill, but many of the Franco-Burgundians were wounded alongside their steeds. Despite this, the poorly armoured Azabs were no match against the mighty knights of Europe, and many were killed in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Seeing that this front line was in grave danger of collapsing, Bezid ordered for his Tamali Sapahi heavy cavalry to hit the flanks of the Franco-Burgundian host, while his janissaries reinforced the Ottoman front line. This stabilized the Ottoman line, but the fierce, bloody conflict for the slope continued as the best knights of Western Europe went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Sultan's own elite troops. As the battle raged on,
King Sigismund's contingent of the Crusader army, made up of infantry, had finally arrived on the battlefield. Wanting to prevent the two Crusader contingents from uniting their forces at this critical moment in the battle, the now anxious Bayezid played his last hand. Sending forth his remaining Tamali Sipahi cavalry and the remnants of his Akinji and Azeb units, the Ottoman Sultan ordered the creation of a new battle line to be formed between the two Crusader hosts. Meanwhile, the Sultan's own Kapikulu Sipahi cavalry were sent forward to flank around and charged into the rear of the Franco Burgundian knights. The latter move brought about heavy casualties for the Western knights, as they were now surrounded on both sides by Bayezid's elite household troops. As the battle for the slope continued, the newly formed Ottoman line crashed into Sigismund's contingent of the Crusader army. Although taking heavy losses, the Ottoman line successfully prevented the Hungarian monarch from uniting his forces with the Franco-Burgundians, who were at this point in the battle exhausted after hours of fighting under the burning morning sun. With Sigismund unable to break through Ottoman lines to reach the Franco-Burgundians, panic began to spread in the Crusader army. Perhaps seeing the day was lost, and wanting to preserve their troops for future wars against the Ottomans, both Wallachian and Transylvanian contingents of the Crusader host began to withdraw from the battle. Before long, Sigismund's host was now stranded, and the remaining Franco-Burgundians were surrendering to Ottoman troops in droves. At this critical junction, Bayezid delivered the final blow of the battle. The Ottoman Sultan ordered his mounted Serbian knights, led by Stefan Lazarevich, to charge the flank of the remaining Hungarian army. The following Serbian charge would be decisive, as it left many dead on the battlefield, thus resulting in the complete rout of the remaining Crusader army. The remnants of Sigismund's army that survived the Ottoman onslaught made their way up north to the Danube, as Venetian and Genoese ships began preparations for evacuation operations. In full panic, Many Crusaders drowned in the deep waters of the Danube, while the Hungarian king barely escaped with his own life as he was pushed into the river before being saved, dragged onto a local fishing vessel by his personal guard. On his way back to Hungary, Sigismund would place the blame for the Crusader defeat on the Franco-Burgundians, stating that their pride and vanity had cost them the day. The Battle of Nicopolis ended in a decisive Ottoman victory and was the crowning achievement of Sultan Bayezid I's reign. Having suffered a few thousand casualties, the Ottoman Sultan had defeated and scattered a great European Crusader army in a single battle. The following morning after his victory, in retribution for the massacre of Muslim prisoners of Vidin and Oyahovo, the Thunderbolt ordered all those he had taken prisoner in the battle be killed. What followed would be a general massacre of thousands of Crusader soldiers in which many were stripped of their clothing and decapitated. Only a handful of high-ranking noblemen were spared from the onslaught, such as John of Nevers. They were ransomed off to their respective European holdings in the following years. The defeat at Nicopolis caused a wave of shock around Europe, as for the first time, the wider continent was personally made aware of the impending threat of the Ottoman Sultanate. It would take half a century for European powers to recoup and launch another major crusade against Edirne. As a result of the battle, the Ottoman political and military presence in the Balkans was secured. In the following years, Bayezid ramped up his blockade on the Byzantine capital of Constantinople, as no support from Europe now dared to intervene in his military matters. In the next episode, we will go through the last years of the Thunderbolt's reign as a new power in the East would come knocking on the gates of his Sultanate. To ensure you don't miss that, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently, we've started releasing weekly Patreon and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.